When we get serious about uh, Christ's teachings and serious about putting them into uh, practice in our own lives, sometimes we can come across things that Jesus said for us to do that are really difficult. Sometimes when we come across these teachings, they can give us pause, maybe make us a little anxious, maybe even recoil a bit because they're difficult. And today we're going to talk about one of those teachings that I think may be one of the most difficult things that our Lord asked us to do, and that is to forgive. God doesn't ask us to weigh in on what we think about forgiving. He just says, do it. It's necessary, and he exhorts us just to do it. And so it becomes imperative as we truly seek to be conformed to the image of his son to really take to heart what he says and to put it into practice. Now I want to preface what I'm going to be saying today to say this. I understand this is a very difficult topic. And I understand there's probably some folks sitting in this room right now that have been hurt in unimaginable ways by somebody. And even most unfortunate, you may have been hurt by somebody that you had every reason to believe would love you, care for you, be there for you. Could be a family member, could be a church member. It's what makes this difficult. And what I want to say to you is the things that I'm going to bring to your attention this morning I beg you not to construe that what I'm saying is minimizing those issues because you can't minimize them. They're hard. They are difficult. But what I would say to you is that God still says, as I forgave you, forgive. I look at that picture and think of the horror of what Jesus went through on the cross. Tortured, gasping for breath as we saw a few weeks ago, on his way to dying. And I look at that and I say to myself, how in the world did he look down and say, Father, forgive them? for they don't know what they're doing. My point would be that Jesus is not asking us to do something that he wasn't willing to do himself. Those words are just, remarkable is not a strong enough word. But he said that and he meant that. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. We saw last week that the cross is a place of forgiveness. We looked at God's forgiveness toward us. And any understanding of our being a forgiving individual starts there. God forgave us, so we are to forgive others. Simply put, God demands that those who have received His forgiveness... See, receiving forgiveness isn't hard. We want that. But he says, those who I have forgiven are to be forgivers themselves. A couple of passages that bring that home. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That took forgiveness. 
He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave us our sins. So I think attitude comes into play here. I want to read you a quote that I found from Chuck Swindoll. He says, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It's more important than the past. It's more important than education. It's more important than money, circumstances, failures, or successes. It's more important than what other people think or say or do. It's more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It'll make or break a company, a church, or a home. And the remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace. This is an important statement he makes here. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string that we have, and that is our attitude. And I'm convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. Attitude, an attitude of forgiveness. Well, when we have been hurt by somebody, there's some natural feelings that come to the surface. And I would say to you, they're not unnatural. But they're the kind of things that can get in the way of us following through and being a forgiving people. Here's just a few of them. But you don't know what he did to me. They lied about me over over again. She intended to destroy my career, and she did. You can't imagine the trauma I've been through. If you knew what this has done to my family, you'd be angry too. They deserve to suffer like they've made me suffer. I'm going to make them pay. I'll never forgive. Never. However, contrary to those thoughts, God still says, forgive. Life in the kingdom demands that we practice forgiveness. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must, don't you hate that he wrote the word must in there? So you must forgive others. And then Paul wrote in this passage, instead be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. This Ephesians 4.32 passage, I want you to just kind of keep that in your mind here in just a minute. I'm going to make a point about something. But just remember that if you would. What's the meaning of forgiveness? Well, last week we saw that a little bit. Uh, you remember we had that picture of the scapegoat and the priest putting his hands on the scapegoat's head symbolically transferring Israel's sins to that goat, and then they took the goat out into the wilderness and left him out there? Well, that's one, one measure of forgiveness. It means separation, putting some distance between. It means to sin from oneself, to forsake, to put away, or to put off. There's a little more to it than that, though. In that passage I just mentioned for you to kind of keep in your mind from Ephesians 4.32, where Paul said to forgive... The word he uses for forgive there is a different word, and it means simply this, 
It means to give freely and unconditionally or to bestow as a gift of grace and then to remit a debt. Forgiveness is a gift of grace. And at the same time, it's to cancel a debt. Make no mistake, when somebody has harmed you in some way, they do owe you. They do. But forgiveness means I cancel the debt that you owe. Now, let's look for just a second at what forgiveness isn't. It's not approving of what somebody did. It's not pretending that evil never took place. It's not making excuses for other people's bad behavior. It's not justifying evil so that sin somehow becomes less sinful. We're not making excuses for what happened. It's not overlooking abuse. It's not denying that others tried to hurt you repeatedly. It's not letting people walk all over you. It's not refusing to press charges when a crime has been committed. That's not forgiveness. It's not forgetting the wrong that was done. In fact, I would contend that it's almost impossible to do that. It's not pretending you weren't hurt. It's not that you must restore the relationship to what it was before. You may not have thought about that. Forgiveness just takes you. Restoring the relationship to what it was before takes two. Reconciliation takes two. That person may never have any concern about restoring that relationship that was broken. So remember, those are two totally different things. And that doesn't mean, forgiveness doesn't mean that all negative consequences of sin are canceled. The fact of the matter is, forgiveness is difficult. Let me read this to you. Corey Ten Boom author of The Hiding Place, was taken captive and spent time in Nazi concentration camps during World War II. While in prison, Corey saw incredible abuse, so inhumane that it drove the prisoners to incredible depths, including intentionally allowing lice to breed on their bodies, because the more lice they had, the less likely it would be that the guards would molest them. And Corey even witnessed the death of her own sister in those camps. After the war, God sent Corey Ten Boom on a mission of mercy through the war-torn cities to encourage residents to choose forgiveness over bitterness. She would motivate her audiences by sharing some of the atrocities that she had experienced, implying that if she could forgive such horrors, so could her listeners. One night, speaking, she immediately recognized the man who came walking down down the aisle as a particularly cruel guard in one of the concentration camps. Now, this isn't a made-up story. This isn't just an illustration to try to encourage forgiveness. This is true. The man did not recognize her, however. As he approached Corey, as he approached Corey, he said, Ma'am, you don't know me but I was a guard in one of those camps. After the war, God saved me. I wish I could go back and undo those years. I can't, but I've just been prompted by God to come tonight and ask you, would you please forgive me? And then he extended his hand to her. Can you imagine? The horrible thoughts and memories that raced through Corey's mind as she recognized his face and then even worse, heard his incredible plea for forgiveness. How could she? 
Corey said her arms froze at her side and she was literally unable to move. The flashbacks in her mind replaying the atrocities, the death of her sister, the abuse. And then she said she felt God's Spirit saying to her, Corey, what have you been telling everyone else to do? As an act of your will, will you choose to forgive? And then she went on to explain what happened next. I reached out my hand and I put it in his, and I said, you're forgiven. And she later reported that at that moment, it was like a dam had broken loose. All the bitterness and resentment. God had truly set me free. Forgiveness is hard work. It's difficult. And I think we see this in a passage in Luke when Jesus talks to the, uh, his disciples about forgiving. Before we go there, though, I like this quote by C.S. Lewis. Everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. I think that's true. When well, Luke 17, we read this. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. I mean, that tells me right off the bat, they are thinking, man, this is hard stuff. This, I don't have it in me to do this. Lord, increase our faith. And it's interesting what Jesus says to them. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. I think what Jesus was saying to them is, in terms of this idea of forgiveness, it's not how, about how much faith you've got. Because even the teeniest, tiniest bit of faith, that of a mustard seed, can do great things. I think what he was telling them that day is it's not about the faith you have, assume, and he's assuming they do have some. It's not about the faith you've got. It's about putting that faith into practice. Because the idea there again, is trust in God. This lesson is not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons why I did the lesson a few weeks ago on the fact that we've got to depend upon God if we're going to put the Christian life into practice. And it is nowhere more important than this. Because we are fooling ourselves if we think we've got it within ourselves to do this. But God says, with me on board, anchored into me, trusting me, you can move mountains. So the point I would make is, it is so important as we move forward and think about this idea of forgiveness that we recognize it's not going to be able to be done by our own actions, our own, our own strength. It's going to take God heavily involved in that process. But here's the good news. If he is, it can happen and will. question comes up sometimes about it. Do I have to forgive somebody that doesn't repent? I'm going to give you my opinion on this. You can take it or leave it. Draw your own conclusions. But I'm going to tell you why I think this and why I've settled on this position. I don't think so. I think we're just supposed to forgive. We're going to look at a passage in just a moment where Peter came to Jesus and asked him, Lord, how many times am I supposed to forgive? Seven? I've got an idea. Peter was feeling pretty magnanimous that day because in his day, the rabbi said you have to forgive three times. 
above three, you don't have to worry with it anymore. So I want you to think a little bit about what Peter is really asking by saying, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive? Seven times? Inherent in that question is, Lord, when can I stop forgiving? Give me a number. And I think to ask the question, do I have to forgive somebody that hasn't repented or asked my forgiveness, kind of goes along the same lines. Lord, is there a stand I can take somewhere in this where I don't have to be forgiving? If we seek to fulfill and apply the words of Jesus faithfully, it's almost inevitable that we're going to encounter people who are not going to be seeking our forgiveness. In fact, they're probably going to seem like they think they haven't really done anything wrong and they don't care about that. But do their actions give me the right to not forgive? I don't think so. I really truly believe God would say to us, you just keep on forgiving 70 times 7. And I think Jesus' other teachings really support that idea. Remember when he said, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, pray for those who abuse you? Well, they're not necessarily going to quit being our enemy when we bless them. And they haven't necessarily asked for our forgiveness when we do that. They might not ever think to do that. They may even be content with being our enemy forever. They may be intent upon making our life difficult as long as they're around. But Jesus says, bless them. And blessing is the opposite of holding a grudge. And so I would suggest to you that, at least from my perspective, regardless of the circumstances, we just forgive. In Jesus' words on the cross, God forgive them, Father forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. I think really speaks to that. Because the people that day weren't asking Jesus for his forgiveness. He had soldiers at the foot of that cross throwing dice to take his clothes. Total indifference to his suffering. People walked by and taunted him. You said you could save others. How about saving yourself? Can you imagine I cannot imagine that, seeing somebody suffering like that and throwing those kinds of taunts at them. And Jesus is looking down at those folks and saying, Father, forgive them. So, in answer to the question, does somebody have to repent before I have to forgive? My opinion is, we just be forgiving folks. And I think it's important to note that Jesus, in a very real way, links our forgiveness from God to our being forgiving. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I did not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Wouldn't you love to see the look on Peter's face when he said that? <laughs> Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, what you've got to understand in understanding this parable is 10,000 talents is a humongous sum that he couldn't pay back in a million lifetimes. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Now, you can't pay him all. 
Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, a hundred denarii is little to nothing. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. And so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. His master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to his torturers until he should pay all that was due him. And then Jesus closes out the parable with these words, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. I think this is where it all starts, this idea of forgiving. The foundation that's laid for us to be forgiving is an understanding and recognition of how much we have been forgiven. As I said, the servant could not pay back in multiple lifetimes what he owed. And yet in begging for forgiveness, he was forgiven. That's us. That's us. But he turned around. No forgiveness. I did some math earlier on myself, figuring my 66 years here on earth, I figured if I sinned one time a day, how many times has God forgiven me? Just once. And that's a joke. Anybody in here willing to raise their hand and say, I only sin once a day? I mean, that's not too bad. But I took once, once a day. I think if I remember right, because I did this a few years back, if I remember right, it was over 20,000 sins. <laughs> that's one time a day. How about 10, 20, 30 times? Figure that out. And that's the point Jesus is wanting to make here. You have been forgiven so much. How dare you not forgive yourself? And forgiveness is an empowered work. <clears throat> that passage in Ephesians where Paul said forgive, Earlier in that book, he had said this, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And then Paul goes on from there and calls upon all of us to put on the new man in Christ, but he recognized we can't do that without that. I'm going to ask you a question, and you may say, you've got to be crazy, man you got to be nuts. I'm going to ask it anyway. Is it possible that the enemy in your life just might be a blessing from God? Now, <laughs> hey, I know, it's easy for me to stand up here in the pulpit and talk to you folks, ask that question. But I want you to think about something for just a moment. And to try to answer that question... I want to take you all the way back to Genesis and Joseph. Now, I, I don't have the time to go through the whole story, but you remember it, how his brothers took him out, determined to kill him. The only thing that stopped them from killing him is this caravan came by, and so they sold him to this caravan who took him on to Egypt. And you know the story of Joseph in Egypt. Some really difficult things happened to him, but ultimately he came to great power in Egypt. 
And then later on, his brothers show up, and they don't remember who he is. They don't recognize him. Now, you think about that for just a moment. The power that man had, what he could have done to those brothers. But you remember in the story, he treated them kindly. He put them through a little bit. He treated them kindly. And at the end of that story, he says this, and this is what I mean by this question. Is it possible that the enemy in your life just might be a blessing from God? Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, that's to his brothers, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Oh, if we could just have those eyes to see even in the horrific moments that God's making good out of it. Same could be said of Jesus. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. He despised the cross, despised the shame, endured the cross, despised the shame because he could see beyond the cross. He could see the good that God was going to perform in that horrible circumstance. Also think about this. That attitude on display there by Jesus and Joseph, that attitude still comes with the hurt. I would have to imagine that Joseph bore the hurt of his brothers wanting to kill him all of his life. And I know for a fact the Savior bears the scars of the nails driven into his hands. But both of them were able to see beyond those things and see the good that God was going to perform in those things. It's quite remarkable. Well, why does God require us to forgive anyway? That's an easy one to answer. He knows what's best, and He knows what's best for us. And what I mean by that is this, a lack of practicing forgiveness impacts your emotional, relational, and spiritual well-being. Withholding forgiveness does nothing to the one that has hurt us. We really need to see that. Withholding forgiveness does nothing to the one who has hurt us. We are only hurting ourselves. Holding on to a spirit of revenge, bitterness, grudges is not healthy and it will take a toll. Learning to forgive is one of the secrets of a happy, fulfilling Christian life. A man by the name of David Augsburger wrote this about forgiveness, and he wrote it in the context of a marriage, but it, it doesn't have to be a married circumstance to see the wisdom here. He says, forgiveness is hard, especially in a marriage tense with, a marriage tense with past troubles, tormented by fears of rejection and humiliation, and torn by suspicion and distrust. Forgiveness hurts especially when it must be extended to a husband or wife who doesn't deserve it, who hasn't earned it, who may misuse it. It hurts to forgive. Forgiveness costs, especially in marriage when it means accepting instead of demanding repayment for the wrong done, where it means releasing the other instead of exacting revenge, 
where it means reaching out in love instead of relinquishing resentments. It costs to forgive. Stated psychologically, forgiveness takes place when the person who was offended and justly angered by the offenders bears his own anger and lets the other go free. Anger cannot be ignored, denied or forgotten without doing treachery in hidden ways. It must be dealt with responsibly, honestly, in a decisive act of the will. Either the injured and justifiably angry person vents his feelings on the other in retaliation, and that's an attempt at achieving justice as accuser, judge, and hangman all in one, or the injured person may choose, and that's the key here, forgiveness is a choice, may choose to accept his angry feelings, bear the burden of them personally, find release through confession and prayer, and set the other person free. This is forgiveness. Uh, well, how, uh, well, talking about the cost, there's one eternal principle which will be valid as long as the world lasts. The principle is that forgiveness is a costly thing. Forgiveness is the most costly thing in the world. Of course, as you look at the, the cross, it costs God his son. Well, how do we know when we've actually forgiven? I came across this list and thought it was pretty good. Before I read it, I want you to listen to this briefly. Genuine forgiveness, however, does not excuse the wrong of others. Compassion and mercy will not rationalize an offense away, but will always call it what it is. But in confronting a sin, the forgiving believer will eliminate bitterness and all other negative feelings that can only increase the sin rather than eliminate it. Then he or she can confidently and sincerely pray the familiar prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Well, what are some things that kind of show that we are we have reached that point of forgiveness. We face what they did and forgive them anyway. We don't keep bringing it up to them. We don't talk about it to others, except, and please see that in parentheses, that does not include necessary counseling. Counseling can be extremely important in all this. We show mercy instead of judgment. We refused to speak evil of them. We chose not to dwell on it. We pray for them. If you can honestly go to God in prayer for that person, you can pretty well figure you have forgiven them. We ask God to bless them. Same idea. We don't rejoice at their calamities. Well, that's a tough one because you, you want to see them They've done something to you, man. We help them when we can. Wow. <clears throat> I took the time to go through some counseling websites to kind of get an idea of what counselors say in terms of helping a person through the process. So this isn't, uh, these aren't my words, they're somebody else's words, but I think they're good. You can't forgive what you can't face or won't face. Refusing to feel the pain and acknowledge the hurt or say it, it mattered will not allow us to move past and let go. Numbing and avoidance are not negative coping, strat are negative coping strategies. Forgiving doesn't mean forgetting, but it does mean letting go. When stuck in the chains of unforgiveness, you pay the price, not the person who hurt you. Letting go gives the responsibility of dealing with the other person back to God and releases us to be all He created us to be. Forgiveness is not a choice. Or it is a choice, not a feeling. We simply can't wait for some sort of feeling for forgiveness to show up. 
We might not be able to control how we feel, but we can believe that God has the power to align our feeling with a decision to forgive. And forgiveness sets us free. Ultimately, forgiveness is for our benefit. Unforgiveness is like drinking a poison and expecting the other person to get sick. Draw on the love of God to mend the pain and hurt. Let his love help you experience freedom found in his forgiveness. And then a couple of others that I wrote down. Validate that sin is painful. The Bible validates the destructive effects of sin. You should not feel guilty or wrong about feeling that way. There is ample compassion, mercy, and grace in Christ for you. Jesus himself extends, ex- entered this world and felt the deep affliction that comes from sin. And because he did, he is a merciful and compassionate to help us. And there's a great passage in Hebrews that I think of in terms of calling upon God and his help in this process. It's Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And then listen to this. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then finally, remember in the end that God will judge and make everything right. You and I can count on that. In the end, God's going to make it all right. That's our hope. And we can rest in God because He will deal with everything in accordance with His inflexible justice, perfect wisdom, and eternal goodness. Very briefly, just kind of a recap. Withholding forgiveness does nothing to the one who hurt us. We're only hurting ourselves. Learning to forgive is one of the secrets of a happy, fulfilling Christian life. Failure to practice forgiveness impacts the emotional, relational, and spiritual well-being of a Christian. We will never fully enter into our freedom in Christ until we learn the freedom of forgiveness. As long as we hold on to our resentments, we are chained to our past. And then this quote by Warren Wiersbe, An unforgiving spirit is the devil's playground, and before long it becomes the Christian's battleground. If somebody hurt us, either deliberately or unintentionally, and we do not forgive, then we begin to develop bitterness within which hardens the heart. We should be tender-hearted and kind, but instead we are hard-hearted and bitter. Actually, we're not hurting the person who hurt us. We are only hurting ourselves. In His gracious kindness, God has forgiven us, and we should forgive others. We do not forgive for our sake, though we do get a blessing from it, or even for their sake, but for Jesus' sake. I want to close. I'm going to try to get through. When I came across this, I sat in my chair for five minutes and couldn't move. And I'm not ashamed to say I cried. Oh, Lord. Remember, not only the men and women of good will, but also those of ill will. But do not remember all of the suffering they have inflicted upon us. Instead, remember the fruits we have borne because of this this suffering. (laughs) 
our fellowship, our loyalty to one another, our humility, our courage, our generosity, the greatness of heart that has grown from this trouble. When our persecutors come to be judged by you, let all of these fruits that we have borne be their forgiveness. That was found in the clothing of a dead child at the Ravensbrook concentration camp. Thank you, Peter. I hope to God I'm never faced with something like that. But that tells me even in the worst of circumstances, the human spirit, aided by God, can overcome. And so I'll leave you with this. You are never more like Jesus than when you forgive those who have sinned against you. And so I suppose the ultimate question is, do we really want to be like him?